Chapter Twenty Six of Northwest. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Northwest by Harold Bindloss. Chapter Twenty Six. Deering takes the trail. Stannard was marked by a superficial languidness. Strangers thought him careless, and his humorous tranquillity had charm. For all that, when speed was important, he moved fast, and after he telephoned to the station, he got to work. He packed rucksacks for his companions, got ropes and ice axes, and arranged with the hotel cook to put up a supply of food. Then he sent a messenger for two or three half-breeds who carried loads for fishing parties. Stevens helped and admitted that Stannard knew his job. All he did was carefully thought about. After some time, Dillon joined them, and Stannard said, "'It's awkward, but Wilmer at Revelstoke is engaged. However, he states he can send us a useful man, and we are to meet him at the station. He'll come by the train in the morning, and we'll get on board.' We ought to reach the railroad hut Jimmy talks about by dark, and if the night is clear, we'll push on. If the police are about the station where we get off, they may stop us. It's possible, Stannard agreed. Still, they don't know our object, and we must persuade them we are mountaineering tourists. Boast about your climbing and the Canadian Alpine Club. Stevens knows their exploits. All the same, I imagine the police are in the mountains. Well, your sack is packed, and when you have got your snow spectacles and the grease for your skin, we'll stop for a smoke. In the morning, the half-breed packers arrived, and soon afterwards all were ready to start. The hotel servants and three or four guests came to see them go, but when the others strapped on their loads, Stannard joined Laura on the steps. "'Well, we are going to Jimmy's help,' he said with a smile. "'Frank is very keen, but as far as possible I'll try to see he does nothing rash. "'To know your marriage is fixed is some comfort.' Laura looked up quickly. Although Stannard's smile was kind, she was vaguely disturbed. "'When Frank wanted the wedding soon, I thought you agreed rather easily.' I was satisfied to stay with you for some time. Oh, well, said Stannard, I'm afraid I haven't carried out my duties. I'm a careless fellow and feel my daughter does not owe me much. Although you have grown up beautiful and attractive, nature and your aunts are accountable. Then, you see, I'm getting old and mountaineering is my hobby. Sometimes one slips on an icy rock "'You mustn't talk like that. It hurts,' said Laura, with a touch of emotion. "'You gave me all I asked for. You have always indulged me. "'Then I urged you to go, and now I feel I ought not to urge. "'To be generous in my way costs one nothing. "'I shall not venture on the rocks. I send you.' "'Stannard laughed, but Laura, studying him, was moved. Her father was handsome and wore the stamp of high cultivation. Although he was not young, he carried himself like an athlete. She knew his strength and pluck and his gentleness to her. Now she thought him fine and chivalrous. "'You follow your heart,' he said, and kissed her. Then he pulled out his watch. "'But I must not be selfish, and Frank is waiting.' Dillon advanced, and Stannard resumed. "'Youth is romantic and sometimes exaggerates. Laura imagines her generosity, and yours accounts for my starting on our adventure. Well, perhaps I'm slow and cautious, but now and then one recaptures a touch of one's boyish rashness. However, I mustn't philosophize. We must get off in a few minutes.' "'I'll join you on the trail,' said Dillon, who remarked that Stannard implied that he hesitated to go. 
Stannard had said something like that before, as if he wanted others to note that the plan was not his. All the same, it was not important, and Dillon took Laura's hand. Five minutes afterwards, the party started. The packers carried the heavy loads, the others the ice axes, and Stevens and Stannard wore round their shoulders coils of alpine rope. Where the trail turned, they stopped for a moment and waved their hats, and then vanished in the trees. Some time afterwards, Laura saw a plume of black smoke roll across the pines and stole off to her room. She did not want Mrs. Dillon's comfort. Her father and her lover had started for the rocks, and if they paid for their rashness, she was accountable. In the morning she got a jar, for a sergeant of the Royal Northwest Police arrived at the hotel. He was polite but firm and Laura saw she must brace up. Mrs. Dillon had gone with her to the rotunda, and to know she had her help was some comfort. "'Mr. Stannard started for the mountains yesterday,' the sergeant remarked. "'He took a quantity of camp truck and two of your friends. Where did he go?' "'I don't altogether know his line,' Laura replied. When you climb high mountains, you cannot make fixed plans. Much depends on the snow. Well, I expect Mr. Stannard stated where he meant to start. Why, of course, said Mrs. Dillon. He'd get off at the Green River Depot. The sergeant remarked her frankness, but thought she saw some frankness was indicated, because for him to find out where the party had got off was not hard. Do you know Mr. Stannard's object? Our clubmen go for the rocks in summer. His starting now was strange. Laura lifted her head, and her look was proud. She thought she could play up, and the fellow must not imagine Stannard had gone to Jimmy's help. My father is not a Canadian clubman. He's a famous alpine mountaineer and can go where others cannot. "'Our boys are pretty smart,' said the sergeant, smiling. "'But are all Mr. Stannard's party expert mountaineers? Mr. Stevens, for example, and Mr. Frank Dillon?' "'My son,' said Mrs. Dillon, who saw the other had talked to the hotel clerk, "'Frank knows something about the rocks and belongs to a club that explores the Olympian range. We're Americans.' The sergeant bowed politely, but she resumed, "'Mr. Stannard's English. All the lot are tourists, and I sure can't see what the Canadian police have to do with their going off to climb your rocks. You're not going to draw strangers to the country if you bother them like that.' "'Sometimes the police's duty is awkward,' said the sergeant, in an apologetic voice. The police have not much grounds to inquire about my father's excursion, Laura remarked haughtily. When he killed the bighorn, he did not know he poached on a game reserve, but he paid the fine and it is done with. The sergeant saw her eyes sparkled, and she was not playing a part. She did not know all he knew, and he must not enlighten her. Not long since Mr. Stannard went shooting with the pit light, which is not allowed, and the game warden was shot. My father did not shoot the warden. He stayed and helped the police. Three of his party pulled out, the sergeant rejoined. Maybe Mr. Leyland could put us wise about the shooting, and we reckoned Mr. Stannard knows where he is. "'Then you must wait for his return. "'If you found his track, "'I don't suppose you could follow him on the rocks.' "'In the meantime, you're resolved not to help us hit his track?' "'I don't know his track,' Laura replied. "'The sergeant went off. "'He had talked to the hotel clerk, "'and although he had not found out much from Laura, "'he had found out something.' 
the girl was persuaded Stannard had gone off to help Leyland, and the sergeant thought his plan really was to help the young fellow get away. In fact, the sergeant thought he saw Stannard's object for doing so. Laura, however, was disturbed. She was anxious for Jimmy and knew the risks Stannard ran in the mountains, but she imagined she had baffled the sergeant, and she resigned herself to wait for news. When the next train for the coast rolled across the pass, Deering was on board a first-class car. He was dressed like a city sportsman, but his clothes were thick and his shooting jacket was lined with sheepskin, for Deering knew the wilds. When he went to Vancouver, his movements interested the police, but at Calgary they left him alone, and nothing indicated that they now bothered where he went. Deering thought it strange, unless they knew something he did not. In the meantime, he was occupied by another subject. Although he meant to see Jimmy out, he had frankly no use for hiding much longer at the ranch. Jimmy must be smuggled across the boundary to the United States, and Deering weighed a plan. When he got down at the station, he meant to push on for Jardine's. But Kelshope was some distance off, and he resolved to stop at the hotel. He had been for some time at Calgary, and Stannard would perhaps know if Jimmy was all right. The clerk sent for Laura, and by and by she came down. She gave Deering a cold glance, but he had long known her antagonism. "'You cannot see my father. He and Frank are in the mountains,' she said. Deering knitted his brows. When winter had begun, one did not start for the rocks for nothing. "'It looks as if the police have found out Jimmy was at his ranch.' "'Then Jimmy was at the ranch? We didn't know.' He did not come to see us. I expect you stopped him? You don't trust me, Miss Laura. Still, you ought to see Jimmy dared not come to the hotel. I did not think you a proper friend for Jimmy and Frank. Deering smiled. He knew he was a better friend of Jimmy than Stannard, but he said, Oh, well, perhaps it's not important. Anyhow, Jimmy trusts me, and I mustn't let him down. You imply he's not at the ranch? Laura told him about Jimmy's note, and he inquired about Stannard's plans. When she had satisfied his curiosity, his look was thoughtful. Stannard will send back the packers at the bottom of the rocks, he remarked. Has he got a guide? He could not engage the guide he wanted. Another man about whom I don't think he knew much was sent. Your father needs a useful man. Jimmy's steady on an awkward pitch, but sometimes he's rash. The others are raw boys. It looks as if I've got to hit the trail. Frank is not a boy, and my father is a famous climber, Laura rejoined. If he cannot cross the mountains, do you think it's possible for you? Then you ought to have started before. The police have followed Jimmy for some time, and I think another party set off yesterday. Deering, thought to embarrass him, gave her some satisfaction, but he smiled. I know you're not my friend, Miss Laura, but I must try to be resigned. All the same, unless you put me wise, it may be awkward for Jimmy. What about the last lot of police? She told him, and he bowed. Thank you. I'll get off. But the sergeant is in front of you, and there is not a train. The police are pretty smart, but I've known them bluffed, Deering remarked. Then the station agent and another fellow talked about a construction train's going up the line. I've traveled on board a calaboose before. Laura hesitated and then gave him her hand. After all, I think you want to help, and if you agree to leave Frank alone, 
"'I rather think you don't know your power,' Deering rejoined with a twinkle. "'Frank is well guarded from all my wiles. In fact, I'm willing to give you best.' "'Oh, well,' said Laura, "'perhaps I was not just.' He went off, and Laura mused. She had not liked Deering. He was a gambler and exploited the extravagance of rich young men. Yet Frank trusted the fellow, and she began to doubt if her antagonism were altogether warranted. For one thing, Deering was staunch, and his pluck was rather fine. Her father had started with a well-equipped party. Deering went alone, and when he got to Green Lake must baffle the police. Then she liked his humorous politeness. He knew she doubted him, but he was not revengeful. On the whole, she thought when she gave him her hand, she took the proper line. End of chapter 26 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 27 of Northwest. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Northwest by Harold Bindloss. Chapter 27 Deering's Progress. Soon after Deering started from the hotel, he met Jardine. Deering knew the shrewd Canadian Scots and thought the rancher a man to trust. Moreover, he had not yet got all the light he wanted. Jardine was on foot, and Deering said, "'Hello! It's a long hike to Kelshope. Where's your horse?' "'Margaret's got the cayuse at Green Lake. Do you not ken?' "'I didn't know,' said Deering. "'But you're coming from the station.' When do they expect the construction train? She stopped down the track for the boys to fix some rails. The operator was grumbling because she'd not got through till dark, and he'd got to block the line for the Kamloops freight. Oh, well, said Deering, since I want to get on board the Calaboose, perhaps her stopping in the dark is not a drawback. But what about Miss Margaret's going to Green Lake? Jardine looked at him rather hard. "'I allow you're Mr. Leyland's friend?' "'Sure thing,' said Deering. "'Jimmy reckons you his friend. "'Well, I want to know how he got away.' Jardine told him, and Deering pondered. He had undertaken an awkward job, and since he saw some obstacles, he resolved to give the rancher his confidence. Among the trees, the frost was not keen, and the sun was on the road. Deering indicated a spruce log and pulled out some cigars. "'Suppose we take a smoke and talk,' he said, and when Jardine lighted a cigar, resumed, "'Won't Miss Margaret shooting the fellow's horse make trouble for her?' "'I reckon not,' said Jardine, who had heard the trooper's statement and when he got a note from Margaret, remarked that the narratives did not agree. "'I'm thinking the boys didn't mean to pit it on Margaret, and the trooper's not altogether proud.' "'It's possible. But why didn't you put Jimmy Wise?' "'I'd cut my foot chopping a day or two before.' Deering rather doubted if Jardine's cutting his foot accounted for all, but he said— Let's talk straight. I suppose Miss Margaret is going to marry Leyland? Maybe, but I dinna ken. Jimmy wanted to marry her. Very well, said Deering. I'll tell you all I know. He narrated his interview with Laura and Stannard's going to Jimmy's help. Jardine's look got thoughtful, and sometimes he frowned. When Deering stopped, he said, "'You dunna trust Stannard. You'd sooner Jimmy hadn't gone across the rocks with him?' "'I would sooner he had not,' Deering agreed. 
Jimmy trusts Stannard, the others are tenderfoots, and I understand they have not a first-class guide. The man they've got is not a mountain guide of a... Uh. Gillane's a packer on the government surveys. But I don't see much light yet. Jimmy owes Stannard a good sum. Leyland insured his life in Stannard's favor, and Stannard wants money. Well, I'm going up the line with the construction gang to follow the party's trail. Jardine got up, and his look was very grim. Just that. I'll join you. Not at all, said Deering. Your part's to go to Green River Depot afterwards and watch out. I expect you're a good bushman, but this is a job for a first-class mountaineer. Besides, you cut your foot. Jardine gave him a keen glance, but Deering resumed. You see, I must hit up the pace and can't boost you along. Can I hire a young man, a prospector if possible, at Green River? The other's arguments did not move him, and by and by Jardine resigned himself to stay behind. I'm thinking my nephew, Peter, is the man you want. Whiles he goes to the depot for his groceries and mail. The storekeeper will ken if he's about. You can tell Peter I sent you to him. After a few minutes, Deering went off, but he went slowly and did not keep the road to the station. Joining the line two or three miles down the valley, he found a track grader's tool hut and went in and smoked. The hut was cold, but Deering's fur coat was thick and good. When dusk began to fall, he walked along the track and stopped three or four hundred yards from the station. By and by, a light twinkled like a star in the gloom of the woods. A steady throb rolled up the valley, and presently Deering distinguished a locomotive's measured snorts and the rumble of wheels. The star was now a dazzling moon, and its reflections picked out, far in advance, glittering rails and frost-spangled trees. When the locomotive was level with Deering, he began to run up the line, and soon after the train stopped and he got behind the last car. He knew the company's rules, but he knew something about train gangs, and he had ready a few dollar bills. Although the station agent did not see him get on board, when the train rolled up the track he occupied a box in front of the calaboose stove. The men gave him supper and when he had drained a can of strong coffee, he pulled out some cards and showed how an expert puzzled his antagonists. Cold drafts swept the rocking calaboose, the stove roared, and one smelt locomotive smoke. Labored snorts echoed in the rocks, couplings rang, and when the train sped across a bridge, the roll of wheels drowned Deering's voice. Deering smiled and waited for the noise to stop. He had undertaken a daunting job and was bothered about Jimmy, but in the meantime he owed something to his hosts and he played up. Although Deering had some drawbacks, his rule was to play up. A number of the men had long studied cards and could bluff on a poor hand. Three or four won regularly some part of their companion's wages, but they knew a master's touch, and for a time Deering held the group. Then he lighted his pipe and began to talk about something else. He found out that the train ran between a gravel pit and Green River. The men were filling up a trestle and cutting out an awkward curve. "'Have they got a hotel at the settlement?' Deering inquired. They've no use for a hotel at Green River. Sometimes a rancher comes in for his mail and a survey party jumps off. I guess that's all. You can stop at the post office. The man who keeps it runs a small store. Nothing much doing yet, Deering remarked. Do the mounted policemen come to the settlement? 
a big shovel man laughed. They're getting busy around Green River. Two lots came in not long since, and a trooper's there now, but he won't bother you. Looks as if he was sent to watch out for somebody who wants to get on the train. Then you reckon they're after somebody in the rocks? said Deering carelessly. That's so, another agreed. I wouldn't bet much on the fellow's chance. When we ran up with the last load, a police outfit was starting for the range. Three or four troopers and a pack horse. They'd loaded up some truck. Oh, well, said Deering, the Royal Northwest are smart boys, but I've known them beat. However, I've been for some time on the road and think I'll go to bed. Can somebody give me a bunk? They gave him a bunk, and for an hour or two he slept, but he knew it might be long before he slept warm again. When he awoke, the locomotive bell was tolling, and the roll of wheels was getting slack. The calaboose was very cold, and Deering, jumping from his bunk, went to the open door. In front, a fire burned by a water tank, and the beam from the headlamp flickered across a small clearing and touched a wooden house. Farther off, a big blast lamp threw up a pillar of flame. The light tossed, and for a few moments all was shadowy. Then the strong illumination leaped up again, and Deering saw a man who carried a short rifle walk along the line. He knew the Royal Northwest uniform. Deering picked up his fur coat and hesitated. In the mountains one must wear proper clothes, and the coat was good, but unless he could cheat the trooper he might not reach the mountains. He touched the man who had given him the bunk. "'I'll trade my coat and a cap for yours.' The fellow's skin coat and cap were old, and he looked at Deering with surprise. Why do you want to trade? A track grader doesn't buy Revelon furs. Deering indicated the trooper. The policeman might calculate something like that, but I expect he knows you belong to the gang. You are going to dump some rails, and for half an hour I want a job. Now I get you, said the other. He pulled off his shabby coat, and when the train stopped and Deering jumped down, nothing distinguished him from the construction gang. Climbing onto a flat car, he joined the men who threw down the rails, and presently saw the trooper stop the fellow who wore his coat and cap. He did not know how the railroad man accounted for his wearing good furs, but he was obviously a track grader, and after a few moments the trooper let him go. Then the train rolled up the line, and Deering stayed with the men who moved the rails. By and by, the trooper walked past the gang, glanced at the men carelessly, and, turning back, vanished in the gloom. Deering thought him satisfied nobody but the track graders was about, and soon afterwards he started for the house. So far he had trusted his luck but he wanted help and must get food. Moreover, he must not excite the storekeeper's curiosity. A clump of pines cut the illumination up the track. Sometimes, when the blast lamp's flame leaped up, bright reflections touched the house, but for the most part the ground in front was dark. When Deering was near the door, a man came out and stopped for a few moments. Deering thought him a rancher, and when he went down the steps met him at the bottom. "'Can I buy some flour and groceries?' he asked. "'You might,' said the other, and looked at Deering as if he thought the inquiry strange. "'Why do you want groceries? Where are you going?' Deering saw something must be risked, and when a risk must be run he did not hesitate. If I can find the trail, I'm going up the valley. Peter Jardine has a ranch at the lake, I think. That's so, 
said the other. I'm Peter Jardine. Deering laughed. His luck had not turned, and when the reflections from the blast lamp touched the rancher's face, he thought he had got the proper man. Then, as soon as you can get me some groceries, I'll start for the rocks. Your uncle sent me along and stated you would help. You see, I'm Jimmy Leyland's partner and Miss Margaret's friend. Ah, said Peter, you're Deering? Well, the police are after Jimmy. For some days two troopers hunted for his tracks, and then a sergeant and another came in on the train and started off as if they knew where he was. In the meantime, a sports outfit hit the trail, but I didn't meet up with them. I made the station in the afternoon and didn't know what I ought to do. In fact, when you came along, I was wondering if I'd pull out for the ranch. You're coming with me. I don't want to boast, but I'm a mountain clubman, and on the rocks I reckon I can beat the police. But Jimmy's friends got off in front of the troopers. There's the trouble. They're not all his friends, Deering rejoined. On the whole, I'd sooner the police got him than he crossed the range with the other lot. But we'll talk about this again. When can you start? I can start as soon as my horse is loaded up, but we have got to bluff the policeman. He mustn't see us take the mountain trail. Well, I've pork and flour and groceries. Have you got all you want? I want a Hudson's Bay blanket and a pack rope, said Deering, and gave Peter a roll of bills. Then you had better buy a frying pan and grub hoe. Very well. Go up the trail across the clearing and wait for me by the creek, said Peter, and returned to the store. After a time he rejoined Deering and tied his loaded horse to a branch. The storekeeper knows I hit the Green Lake Trail, and we don't want the Cayuse. When we have sorted out the truck we need, he'll make the ranch all right. Light the lantern, and we'll fix our packs. Deering lighted the lantern, and after a few minutes strapped a bag of food in his back. He pushed his folded blanket through the straps, gave Peter the rope, and picked up the grub hoe a Canadian digging tool very like a mountaineer's ice axe. Then they put out the light, let the horse go, and went back quietly to the railroad. Nobody was about, and stealing across the line, they plunged into the gloom. "'My luck's good,' said Deering. "'When I think about all we're up against, I sure want it good.'" End of chapter 27 Recording by Roger Moline. Chapter Twenty Eight of Northwest. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Northwest by Harold Bindloss. Chapter Twenty Eight. A Dissolving Picture. After a time, Deering stopped and looked about. The stones on the river bank were large and sharp, the night was dark, and his load embarrassed him. In the distance he saw a small red fire, a dim light marked the post office, and the reflections from the blast lamp quivered behind the trees. Deering got his breath and braced up. Born in the bush, he had known poverty and stern physical toil. He was a good mountaineer but he admitted that his two hundred pounds was something of a load to carry across icy rocks. Then he had, for the most part, lived extravagantly at fashionable hotels, and his big muscles were soft. But this was not all. The distant lights stood for human society and civilization. Deering was very human and fought against an atavistic shrinking from the dark and loneliness. Moreover, he knew the wilds. For all that, he meant to conquer his shrinking. 
he admitted that he was perhaps a romantic sentimentalist, and his adventure did not harmonize with his occupation. Sometimes, however, one was not logical, and not long since he would have plunged down the rocks but for Jimmy's pluck. Besides, he saw Stannard had used him to entangle the lad. Deering had his rude code, but Stannard had none. He was cold and calculating, and Deering thought he meant to carry out the plan he tried before when he sent Jimmy over the neck. Although Deering did not like the job, he meant to baffle him. In the meantime, all was quiet but for the turmoil of the river a few yards off. Dark pines occupied the narrow level belt by the track, and on the other side vague blurred rocks went up. Thin mist drifted about, and the line, running downhill, melted into the gloom. The trooper was at the station, and Deering imagined nobody was about. "'The stones are sharp and slippery,' he said. "'We'll take the track and push on for the section hut.' They got on the line, but did not progress fast. The gravel ballast was large, and hurt their feet. The ties were not evenly spaced. Sometimes Deering stepped on the timber, and sometimes on the loose stones. Then numerous ravines pierced the rocks, and although the construction gangs had begun to fill up the chasms, for the most part wooden trestles spanned the gaps. To cross an open-work trestle in the dark is awkward, and when Deering balanced on a narrow tie and looked for the next, he sweated and breathed hard. On one trestle he stopped. Sixty feet below him he saw the foam of an angry torrent. The next tie was some distance off, and the wood sparkled with frost. In a sense his adventure was ridiculous. When he used the railroad, he went on board a first-class car and checked his baggage. Now he stumbled over the ballast and carried on his back all he could not go without. In the meantime, however, he must cross the trestle, and he trusted his luck and jumped. He got across, and after three or four hours they reached the section shack. Graham was in bed but he got up and told them all they wanted to know. Three policemen with an Indian and a pack horse had come down the track, and Graham imagined they had found the entrance to Jimmy's valley. He reckoned they would send back the Indian and the horse when they took the rocks, but the fellow had not yet returned. Peter was puzzled about the Indian. "'They didn't hire him up at the station,' he remarked. Looks as if they'd fixed it for him to meet them. It looks as if they'd made their plans, and their plans were pretty good, said Deering. However, since they've got a loaded horse, they can't shove on fast. How long was the other outfit in front? Graham told him, and for a few moments Deering pondered. Then he said, It's awkward. Stannard knows where Jimmy is, and he'll hit up the pace. I reckon the police don't know, and must look for his tracks. If we hustle, we'll run up against the gang. The difficulty was obvious, and Peter frowned. We might get by their camp in the dark. We'd see the fire. I doubt, Deering rejoined. If the boys make a fire, they'll make it where the light is hid. They don't want to put Jimmy wise. "'Well,' said Peter, "'what is your plan?' Deering laughed, a noisy laugh, for now he had started, his hesitation vanished. "'We'll trust our luck and shove ahead. In the morning we'll get up the rocks and look about. I've brought my glasses. Let's get going.' Graham gave them directions, and when they climbed a steep hill they found the valley. The ground was broken and in places covered by tangled brush, but they made progress and at daybreak labored across the snow to the top of a spur. Deering sat on his pack and used his prismatic glasses. 
Gray cloud floated about the mountain slopes, but the high peaks were sharp and began to shine in the rising sun. Some were rose pink and some were yellow. The hollows between their broken tops were gray and blue. A map of the mountains occupied a wall of the hotel rotunda, and Deering, using his glasses, imagined it roughly accurate. "'I expect the blue gap is the head of the valley,' he remarked, and when Peter nodded, resumed, "'We'll allow Stander joined Jimmy ahead of the police and took him along. We have got to hit their line, and this is not as hard as it looks. They can't steer for the shoulder of the big peak. The rocks won't go, and I see an ugly ice fall on the glacier.' I reckon I'd head back, obliquely, for the call up the long arete. "'I don't use no habitant French,' Peter observed. "'Oh, well, our club men have begun to use the tourists' talk,' said Deering, and gave Peter the glasses. "'Anyway, you see the ridge that runs up to the neck?' Peter studied the ridge. He had hunted mountain sheep and imagined sun and frost had worn the rocks to something like a knife edge. In places, sharp pinnacles broke the top, and he thought it significant that for the most part the snow did not lie. The shadow behind the top, no doubt, marked a great precipitous gulf, but the farther end of the ridge touched a white hollow between two peaks. If one could get across, one might find a glacier going down the other side. "'I reckon your friends couldn't make it between sun-up and dark,' he said. "'Anyhow, the police would see them on the rocks. "'Stannard might hit a line a few yards below the top, but I imagine the clouds will soon roll up. "'Give me the glasses. I want to locate a gully that goes for some distance up the ridge.' Peter saw his object. The long ridge ran back obliquely from farther up the valley, and to get up by the line Deering marked would cut out the corner. Moreover, Peter imagined the police had reached Jimmy's hut, and if they found the tracks of Stannard's party, they would climb the ridge from the other end. In consequence, Deering's going up the gully would put him in front. "'I guess we'll start.' When we noon, we'll be nearer, and if the mist's not thick, you can look for the line you want. They went down the hill, and by and by the cloud rolled up the slope, and rocks and peaks were lost in gloom. Then Deering began to get tired, for although there was no snow at the bottom of the valley, the ground was rough. After an hour or two, he pushed into the timber and stopped. "'Perhaps it's risky, but I've got to eat and take a rest,' he said. "'The trees are pretty thick, and if the smoke goes up, the hill's a good background.' They cooked some food and then sat by the fire. Not far off, the belt of trees was broken, and presently Deering saw the cloud had got thin and begun to roll back up the mountains. Vague rocks pierced the vapor and grew distinct. The mist trailed away from battered trees and slanted fields of snow. For a time it clung about the high dark precipices, and then one saw the snow-packed gullies seam the crags like marble veins. A faint light pierced the vapor, and the broken top of the ridge began to cut the background. Deering pulled out his glasses and went to the opening in the wood. The light was getting stronger, but he did not think the cloud would altogether melt, and he must search the rocks while search was possible. By and by a beam touched the ridge, and the snow glimmered like pale gold against blue shadow. Above the shadow were broken peaks, but the belt of dark blue indicated a gap and Deering, noting the strong color, thought the gap profound. The landscape, lighted by the unsteady beam, was strangely beautiful. 
the pale illumination did not travel far and the rocks outside its reach owed something of their mysterious grandeur to the contrast deering however was not romantic and thought he saw a line across a steep white slope and up a buttress to the ridge if he could get up he would cut stannard's track and imagined he would not be much behind the party he concentrated on the ridge the slope along the top was not even but went up rather like a terraced walk rocky buttresses supported the terraces and for the most part the stones were free from snow deering knew this indicated a very steep pitch one buttress was marked by a broad white band and when he rubbed the glasses he thought he saw on the snow a small object he had not remarked before the object moved and calling peter he gave him the glasses what's that a cinnamon the bears have come down said peter the bighorn have gone for the low benches i guess the thing's a man deering agreed and waited perhaps it was strange but of all the animals civilized man alone was willing to front the cold on the daunting heights the ridge outlined against a vague background of majestic peaks looked as remote as another world to imagine flesh and blood could reach it was hard but deering meant to try and knew stannard's calculating steadiness if one went carefully studying the obstacles and using the axe and rope it's a man all right i see another said jardine and gave deering the glasses deering saw three men they advanced very slowly and he pictured their cutting steps before they moved one crossed the snow belt and vanished when he was anchored in the rocks he would steady his companions deering knew it was stannard for stannard would not trust a poor guide at a spot like that the others perhaps were dillon and stevens then he saw two more gillane the packer and jimmy anyhow stannard had started with three companions and now he had four deering knew all he wanted to know he watched the party strung out at even distances move across the white band and then the figures melted they had not reached the other side but when he rubbed his glasses they were gone the peaks in the background vanished the ridge got indistinct and the black pines on the lower snowfields faded as if a curtain were drawn across the picture deering shut his glasses and went for his pack the mist was not thick and he knew his line to the buttress put out the fire and let's get off he said you can't cross the ridge in the dark and the cold's going to be fierce peter remarked that is so i doubt if stannard can make the neck but if he gets there he must wait for morning maybe we'll find a hole in the rocks peter said nothing he had engaged to go where the other went and must try to make good although the road was daunting in thick timber a bushman can front biting cold but on the high icy rocks one could not make camp and light a fire if their luck were very good they might find a hole behind a stone in which they must wait for daybreak and try not to freeze he put out the fire and when they went through the wood pondered gloomily to reach the neck would cost them much but to get there was not all they must get down on the other side and for the most part the mountain tops were tremendous precipices peter rather thought the neck opened on a glacier but sometimes a glacier is broken by awkward ice falls all the same peter set his mouth and pushed ahead in the valley he could hit up the pace for deering but he imagined to follow the big fellow on the rocks was another thing 
when a bushman took the rocks he went to shoot bighorn and bear the mountain clubmen studied climbing as one studies the ball game end of chapter 28 recording by roger moline Chapter Twenty Nine of Northwest. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Northwest by Harold Bindloss. Chapter Twenty Nine. Held up. A few pale stars were in the sky, and the moon was over a vague gray peak. Deering shivered, beat his numbed hands, and looked about. The frost was keen, and he had not thought he could sleep, but when he looked about before, the stars were bright and the moon was not above the peak. In front, the buttress cut the sky, and although the rocks were indistinct, he saw the belt of snow Stannard had crossed. Since Stannard had got his party up the buttress, Deering imagined he could get up, but the rocks were awkward. Deering wore the railroad man's skin coat and a thick Hudson's Bay blanket. For climbing, their weight was an embarrassment, but he would sooner carry the load than freeze. Although he lay with his shoulders against Jardine, he was numb, and the outside of the blanket sparkled with frost. A tilted slab partly covered them, but the gravel in the hole was frozen and Deering's hip joint hurt. The worst trouble was, when he was very cold, his brain got dull and he hated to use effort. Yet effort was needed, for day had begun to break and he must cross the neck by dark. To stop another night on the high rocks was unthinkable, and he knew his luck might turn. If thick snow fell or a strong wind blew, he and Peter would stay on the rocks for good. Moreover, Jimmy was in front, and Deering thought Jimmy ran a daunting risk. He ought to get up and start, but he shrank from the frost, and for a minute or two he weighed his grounds for doubting Stannard. Jimmy owed Stannard a large sum and had insured his life. If he went over a precipice, the company would pay Stannard, Deering admitted the argument looked ridiculous. Stannard was highly cultivated, rather extravagant than greedy, and not at all the man to plan a revolting crime. Yet he had not engaged a proper guide, and his companions were trustful young fellows whom he could mislead. Moreover, he had gone down into a snow-swept gully to help Leyland, and knew this would weigh. Stannard had then expected Jimmy to marry Laura. Deering pushed Peter, who woke up and grumbled. Deering opened his pack awkwardly and pulled out a bannock and some canned meat. "'Day is breaking. When you have had your breakfast, we must start.' "'Unless I get a hot drink, I've not much use for breakfast,' Peter replied. "'When do you reckon we'll get down to the timber?' when i camp i like a fire depends on our luck said deering dryly i doubt if you'll make a fire tonight if i wasn't a fool i'd go right back stannard's most a day's hike ahead then if the police have hit his trail they're not far behind us we cut out some ground and on the rocks two men go faster than five Stannard must find a line for his gang and us. Then I expect he'll be held up for a time at the neck. I don't know where the police are. Peter ate the bannock and put on his pack. Well, let's get going. The light was not yet good. Their muscles were stiff. Physical fatigue reached on their nervous strength, and at the belt of snow they stopped. The belt was perhaps ten yards across and occupied a channel in the rocks. The surface was smooth and hard, 
and Deering imagined if one slipped one would not stop until one reached the valley. A row of small holes, however, indicated that Stannard's party had gone across and up the dark forbidding buttress on the other side. Deering frankly shrank from the labor and risk of crossing, but he dared not turn back. "'Where the boys have gone, we mustn't stop,' he said. "'Tie on the rope and give me the grub hoe.' Peter gave him the hoe. The blade was curved, like a carpenter's adze, and at its head was a short pick. The tool, although rather heavy, was a good ice axe. In soft snow one can kick holes, but the snow was hard, and Deering doubted if the notches Stannard had cut would carry him. He used the pick, balancing in a hole while he chipped out the next, and when they got across he sent Peter in front. Their hands were numb, and where the snow had melted veins of ice filled the cracks in the rocks. The hold was bad, and Peter stopped at the bottom of a slab Deering had remarked when he sent him in front. I sure don't know how we're going to get up. Stannard got up, said Deering, and looked about. Thirty feet below him the belt of snow pierced the rocks. It looked nearly perpendicular, and the snowfield at its foot was horribly steep. In the shadow the surface was gray, and dark patches marked where rocks pushed through. A very long way down, across a sharp but broken line, the color was blue, and Deering thought the line the top of a precipice. He turned and looked up. The slab was upright and about ten feet high. He could not see a crack or knob, but he noted two or three fresh scratches. "'Lean against the rock and spread your arms,' he said, and when Peter did so, climbed up his back. Standing on the other's shoulders, he could reach the top of the slab. The top was nearly flat and went back for some distance, but the snow was hard. Deering dared not trust his numbed hands, and he tried the pick. The blade got hold, but he could not see farther than the handle. If he had caught a small lump of ice that would not support him, the rope would pull Jardine off the rock. All the same, something must be risked. "'Brace up good,' he said, and trusted the pick. The tool held, and he got his chest on the top, but now the blade was near his body, his reach was short, and when he used his hand his stiff fingers slipped across the snow. It was obvious he must move the pick, but the tool was his main support, and the effort to push it forward might send him down. Still, if he could get three or four inches higher, he might, perhaps, balance on the edge. His boots got no grip on the smooth slab, but when he used his knee his clothes stuck to the stone. When his waist was nearly level with the top, he pulled out the pick and moved it forward. For a moment or two the blade came back and he began to go down. Then it held, and after a stern effort he was up. The rock above the ledge was broken, and throwing the rope across a knob he helped Peter. Half an hour afterwards they reached the ridge behind the buttress. Deering's hands were bleeding and he was not cold. His skin was wet and he breathed by labored gasps. In front the ridge went up unevenly to the neck. The narrow, broken top, for the most part, was supported by precipitous rocks. One must use caution and could not go fast, but after a time a snow cornice began on one side. The top, leveled by the wind, was smooth, and so far as it rested on the snow was firm. As a rule, a snow cornice is widest above. 
and Deering knew if he crossed the line where it overhang its base, he might break through, but the marks in front indicated where Stannard had gone. Stannard knew much about snow cornices, and Deering wondered whether he could not have found some grounds for throwing off the rope and letting Jimmy venture on the dangerous overhang. He had obviously not done so. Moreover, he had brought his companions up the buttress. If Deering himself had meant to let somebody fall, he thought he would have tried at the awkward slab. In fact, he admitted that to picture Stannard's weighing a plan like that was theatrically extravagant. Yet he knew Stannard, who was not the man people thought. He was very clever, and if he plotted to get rid of Jimmy, he would not do so soon after he had taken him into the mountains. He would wait until he had nearly carried out his job and was bringing his party down from the rocks. Anyhow, Deering's business was to overtake the party. To wonder whether he exaggerated Jimmy's danger would not help. For a time he made good progress along the cornice, and in the afternoon he reached the neck. At the end of the ridge, Stannard's tracks forked. One row of footmarks crossed a steep snowbank running up a peak. The other went along the hollow neck. All the outfit went up the neck, and then two or three turned back, Peter remarked after examining the trampled snow. Deering nodded. Stannard sent them back and pushed ahead with Gillane to look for a line down the other side. When we get across, we'll see what he was up against. At the end of the neck they stopped, and Deering frowned. He had been longer than he thought, and a pale illumination behind a peak indicated that the sun was low. In the valley below he saw a frozen lake and a dark, winding band he knew was timber on a river bank. He had food and if he could reach the trees, he needed not bother about the frost. A Canadian grub hoe, made for cutting roots, is a useful tool, and he could build a wall of bark and branches, light a fire, and brew hot tea. The trouble was to get down to the friendly pines. In front of him a snowfield sloped to a spot at which two uneven, converging rows of dark rocks ought to have met. The rocks were the tops of precipices, but the point of their intersection was cut out, and a glacier began at the gap. Deering could see for a short distance down the glacier until it plunged across the top of a steeper pitch and when he used his glasses he noted its surface was crumpled, as if it broke in angry waves. In fact, it was rather like a rapid suddenly frozen at the top of a fall. Deering knew it was an ice fall, and the waves were giant blocks. The rocks at the side were very steep and veined by snow. "'Nothing's doing here,' he remarked. I don't see Stannard, but he won't find a useful line. Let's look for the boys. They turned, and following the tracks along the neck, after some time went round a buttress that broke the front of the range. On the other side three people occupied a little hollow in the rock. One got up awkwardly. It's Peter, he shouted. "'Why, Deering, you grand old sport!' Deering gave Jimmy his hand and noted that his look was strained and his face was pinched. "'Miss Laura put me on your track and Mr. Jardine wanted to come along,' he said and studied the others who did not get up. "'They've had enough,' said Jimmy. "'We were two nights on the rocks and the cold was keen.' "'Stannard's gone to see if we can get down the glacier, but I don't think he's hopeful. Anyhow, let's go back into our hole. When you wriggle down under a blanket, it's a little warmer than outside.' Deering joined the others. A jammed stone partly covered the hole, 
and the boy's packs, fur coats, and blankets kept them from freezing, but he saw their pluck was nearly gone. "'What about the police?' he asked when he had lighted his pipe. "'We don't know where they are,' Jimmy replied. "'Stannard brought us up the ridge, but from my shack you see another way up at the head of the valley. I went over to study the ground and thought the climb harder than it looks. All the same, I imagine the police have tried it. Of course, when they got to the snow they wouldn't find our tracks, but they know we're in the mountains. "'Then they're south of us?' Jimmy nodded. "'On this side of the range, they'd reckon on our pushing south and expect to cut us off. Now you see why Stannard's keen about getting down the glacier.' "'We can't get down. The icefall won't go,' said Stevens, moodily. "'I doubt if I could get down a ladder. My notion is Stannard knows his plan's a forlorn hope, and Gillane is badly rattled.' "'The fellow's a common packer. Stannard ought not to have hired him,' Dillon agreed. "'Still, we couldn't wait.' and when the Revelstoke man sent Gillane, we were forced to start. Anyhow, I'd trust Stannard where I wouldn't trust a guide. "'He hasn't hit a useful line yet,' Stevens rejoined. "'We're held up, and I doubt if we can stand for another night in the frost.' "'I'm willing to go back and risk the police,' said Jimmy. Still, we couldn't start until daybreak and would be forced to camp again on the ridge. The valley's not far off, if we can make it. "'We must wait for Stannard's report,' said Deering, soothingly. "'When I was at the hotel, the clerk gave me a letter for you.' Jimmy beat his numbed hands and opened the envelope. Then he laughed, a dreary laugh. In a way, the thing's a joke. Leyland's has something to do with a Japanese cotton mill, and Sir Jim writes from Tokyo. He's going to England by Vancouver and sails on board the first CPR boat. He means to stop for a few days and look me up. Jimmy studied the postmark and resumed, I expect he's at Vancouver now. "'Your luck is certainly bad,' Deering remarked in a sympathetic voice. "'Jim's the head of the house. Dick owns him boss,' Jimmy went on. "'His letter's kind, and if he arrived before, when I was making good, I might have got his support. I wanted to persuade him I was not a careless fool, but when he gets to know my recent exploits—' Deering imagined Jimmy had wanted his uncle to agree about his marrying Margaret. Since Sir James was a sober businessman, the lad had not much grounds to hope he would approve his nephew's romantic adventures. "'After all, I rather think we'll cheat the police,' he said. "'They don't know where we are, and when we make the valley we'll hit up the pace. I've friends who'll help you across the frontier.' and you can sail for England from New York. The drawback is we can't make the valley. Stannard can't lead us down, Stevens interrupted gloomily. Deering looked up. We'll know soon. I hear steps. Stannard came round the corner, saw Deering, and stopped rather quickly. Hello, we did not expect you. Were you at the hotel? Have you got some news? I was at the hotel, Deering replied. The morning before I got there, a police sergeant arrived. I understand he was curious about your excursion. Stannard's glance was keen, and Deering thought him disturbed. You imply the fellow knew I'd gone to join Jimmy? Miss Laura imagined something like that. But what about the glacier? Stannard hesitated and knitted his brows. I think we'll risk it in the morning. You see, if we pushed along the range, 
we might meet the police. Besides, we must get down to the timber soon. "'You sure can't get down,' remarked Gillane, the packer, who had followed Stannard. "'We'll try,' said Stannard, and turning to the others, forced a smile. "'Well, I want some food, and Frank might light the spirit lamp. You must brace up for another night on the mountain, but we're lucky because we have got a corner where we shan't freeze.'" End of chapter 29 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 30 of Northwest This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline Northwest by Harold Bindloss Chapter 30 The Gully Day broke drearily. The sky was dark and snow clouds rolled about the peaks. In the hollow behind the rock, Stannard's party crowded around the spirit lamp. One could get no warmth, but in the snowy wilds the small blue flame and steaming kettle called. Moreover, each would soon receive a measured draft of strong hot tea. All were numb, and their faces were pinched. Stevens was frankly despondent, and when Dillon broke his hard bannock his stiff hands shook. Gillane was apathetic, but when Stannard measured out the tea he joked and Deering laughed. To laugh cost the big man something, but he knew he must. Stern effort was needed and human effort does not altogether depend on muscular strength. The packer's mood was daunting, and it was obvious they would not get much help from him. Jimmy was quiet. He must concentrate on holding out and could not force a laugh. He admitted he had not pluck like Stannard's. Stannard was indomitable, and now his gay carelessness was very fine. Although he was the oldest of the party and his face was haggard, he joked and his jokes were good. When the meal was over, he got up and beat his hands. "'We must get down before dark, and I think I know a line,' he said. "'If our luck is good, we'll camp in the trees by a splendid fire.' To start was hard, but they got off and the snow was firm. The steep slope below the neck was smooth, and for a time they made progress. Jimmy remarked the thickening snow cloud and knew Stannard thought it ominous, for he pushed on as fast as possible. So far one could use some speed. The obstacles were in front. The snowfield stopped at the top of a chain of precipices. The rocks were broken by the deep gap through which the glaciers went, but Jimmy noted smaller breaks he thought were gullies filled by snow. He could not see the front of the precipices, but he pictured their falling for six or seven hundred feet. At the bottom, no doubt, were steep spurs and long ridges, across which one might reach the trees rolling up from the valley. The precipice was the main obstacle, but Jimmy did not think the rocks were perpendicular. Anyhow, the glacier was not, and if one could cross the ice falls, it would carry them down. The trouble was, the cloud was getting thick. After a time, they stopped at the head of the glacier, and Stannard, Jimmy, and Deering climbed to a shelf that commanded the ice fall. Mist rolled about, but for some distance one saw the bright white belt curve down between the rocks. Then Jimmy saw the fall and set his mouth. The snowy ice was piled in tremendous blocks and split by yawning cracks. It looked as if the cracks went to the bottom, and one imagined others hidden by fresh snow. Stannard turned to Deering. Who shook his head. The boys can't make it. I doubt if you can. Nothing's doing. 
"'Very well,' said Stannard. "'I marked a gully about two miles south. "'I don't know if you'll like it, but we must get down.' Deering pulled out his watch. "'You have got to hustle. "'The boys can't stand for another night on the mountain.' When they rejoined the others, it looked as if his remarks was justified. Gillane declared if they could not cross the ice fall, they must stop and freeze. Stevens owned he was exhausted, and doubted if he could reach the gully. Jimmy would sooner have risked the fall, since he was persuaded the other line would not carry them down, but if Stannard thought the line might go, he was willing to try it. They fronted the laborious climb to the snow field, and soon after they got there, the mist blew across the slope. The party was now drawn out in a straggling row, and by and by Deering stopped and looked about. He knew two or three were behind him, but he saw nobody. "'Where are the boys?' he shouted. Peter said he had not seen Stevens and Dillon for some time but they were no doubt pushing along, and the party's track was plain. "'I'm going back,' said Deering. "'Watch out for Jimmy.' He plunged into the mist and presently found Stevens sitting in the snow. Dillon was with the lad, and when Deering arrived urged him to get up. Stevens dully refused, and said there was no use in the others bothering. He could go no farther. Deering pulled him up and shoved him along. "'You're going to the gully anyhow,' he shouted with a jolly laugh. "'When we get you there, you can sit down and slide.' Dillon helped, and some time afterwards they came up with Peter. "'Where's Jimmy?' Deering asked in a sharp voice. Stannard reckoned he was near the spot he'd marked. He took a rope, and Gillane and Jimmy went along. They allowed I must stop to watch out for you. "'You let Jimmy go?' "'Sure I did,' said Peter, with sullen quietness. "'I reckon you needn't bother about Jimmy. Something's bitten you. Stannard's all right.' If he can't help us, we have got to freeze. Deering said nothing. Stannard's charm was strong, and cold and fatigue had dulled Peter's brain. There was no use in arguing, and he followed the other's track. He could not see much, for the mist was thick. The ground got steeper, and rocks pierced the snow. It looked as if he were near the top of the precipice, but so long as the marks in front were plain, he need not hesitate. After a few minutes, he saw Gillane. The packer leaned against a massy block round which he had thrown the rope. The end was over the top of the rocks. "'Hello,' said Deering. "'What's your job?' "'I'm standing by to steady Mr. Stannard. Top of the gully's blocked.' and he calculated to get in by a traverse across the front. There's a kind of ledge, but we didn't see a good anchor hold. Deering remarked that the fellow's grasp was slack, and a single turn of the rope was round the stone. If a heavy strain came on the end, he thought the rope would run, and Gillane would not have time to throw on another loop cold and fatigue had made him careless. "'Get a good hold and stiffen up,' said Deering. "'I'm going after Stannard.' The rocks were not as steep as he had thought, and the ledge was wide enough to carry him, but a yard or two in front it turned a corner. Although the mist was puzzling, Deering thought it melted. In the meantime he must reach the corner. Sometimes Jimmy was rash, and if Stannard allowed him to run a risk he ought not to run, nobody would know. When Deering got to the corner, the mist rolled off the mountain top. He saw a tremendous slope of rock 
pierced by a narrow white hollow. For four or five hundred feet the gully went down and gradually melted in a fresh wave of mist. Deering noted the sharpness of the pitch and then fixed his glance on Stannard, who leaned back against the rock. Jimmy, holding on by Stannard's shoulder, was trying to get past on the outside of the ledge. Deering stopped and his heart beat. The others did not see him and he dared not shout, but if Stannard moved it was obvious Jimmy would fall. Stannard did not move, and Jimmy, crossing in front of him, stopped and looked down. "'The stretch is awkward and you can't steady me,' he said. "'Still, I think I could reach the slab and slide into the gully. Before we bring the others, perhaps I ought to try.' "'You have a longer reach than mine, and you are younger,' Stannard replied. Deering could not see the slab, but he imagined Stannard had noted something about it that Jimmy had not. Now Jimmy fronted the other way, Stannard's hand was at his waist, and Deering thought he loosed the knot on the rope. "'Hold on, Jimmy,' he said in a quiet voice. Jimmy stopped. Stannard turned, and although his look was cool, Deering thought his coolness forced. He leaned against the rock, but Deering saw his hands were occupied behind his back. "'I thought you went for Stevens,' he remarked. "'The kid wasn't far back,' Deering replied and laughed. "'Gillane's rattled and half-frozen. I reckon he might let you go, but my two hundred pounds is a pretty good anchor.' Slip off the rope and I'll help Jimmy. He won't pull me off. Stannard awkwardly pulled out the knot, and Deering, who had thought to see the rope fall, was baffled. For all that, he knew Stannard's cleverness and imagined the fellow knew he had experimented. I'm going in front of you, he resumed. Wait until I tie on, Jimmy. You can't trust the slab. When he had tied on, he braced himself against the rock. Jimmy vanished across the edge, and the rope got tight. After a few minutes, he came up. So far as I can see, we can get down by cutting steps, but I couldn't see very far, he said. Your tip about the slab was useful, Deering. The top was rotten, and a lump came off. I was lucky because I put on the rope. On the rocks, caution pays, Deering remarked. Well, let's get up and go for the others. Cutting steps for four or five hundred feet is a pretty long job. They went back along the ledge, but Deering felt slack and his big hands shook. He had borne some strain and rather thought that had he arrived a few moments later, Jimmy, and perhaps Gillane, would have gone down the rocks. Yet he did not know. In fact, he admitted that he might not altogether know. End of chapter 30 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 31 of Northwest. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Northwest by Harold Bindloss. Chapter 31 Stannard's Line. A wave of mist rolled across the rocks, but the vapor was faintly luminous, as if a light shone through. Deering, Stannard, Jardine, and Jimmy waited on the steep bank above the ledge. Gillane had gone back for the others. When he arrived, the party would start. Deering knew the venture was rash and the labor heavy. They would use two ropes, and the leader must kick and cut steps in the snow. The others behind would then occupy the holes and hold him up until he cut another lot. 
Cutting steps, however, soon tired one's arms, and when the leader was exhausted to pull him up and tie on a fresh man might be dangerous. Then nobody knew what was at the bottom, and the gully might break off on the front of an icy cliff. All the same, some rashness was justified. Nothing indicated that the mist would altogether roll away, and in two or three hours it would be dark. If they stopped for another night on the high rocks, all would freeze. An effort to reach the timber and camp by a fire was, so to speak, their forlorn hope. Besides, Stannard was persuaded they could get down, and Deering admitted his judgment was good. By and by, Stannard gave him a careless glance. "'I'll lead on the first rope and take Gillane and Stevens. Jimmy and the others will go with you.' Deering wondered. He was resolved Jimmy should use his rope, but Stannard's proposing it was significant. If Stannard knew why he had joined them on the ledge, it looked as if he were resigned to let Jimmy go. Then Stannard pulled out his watch. "'We must get off. Shout for Gillane. Your voice carries well.' Deering shouted and fixed his glance on the slope behind the group. After a few minutes, two or three indistinct objects loomed in the mist. "'The boys are coming,' he said, and resumed in a puzzled voice. "'Gillane went for Stevens and Dillon.' but I see four. There are four, said Jimmy, and Deering's mouth got tight. He thought the first man did not belong to Stannard's party, and now he saw two others behind the advancing group. The police, said Stannard, and shrugged resignedly. Jimmy turned. His face was pinched and his pose was slack, but his look was calm. You have played up nobly, but we're beaten, and I've had enough. In fact, to know I'm beaten is rather a relief. Deering nodded gloomily. There was no use in trying to get away. The Royal Northwest are empowered to shoot, and, as a rule, shoot straight. He waited and noted mechanically that Stannard was a few yards nearer the top of the rocks. By and by, a police sergeant stopped opposite the group. "'We have got you. Don't move until you get my orders,' he said, and signing a trooper indicated Gillane's party. "'Hold that lot off.' "'We are not looking for trouble, and the boys won't bother you,' said Deering. "'What's your business?' He turned and glanced at Stannard, who said nothing. The mist was getting thin, and Deering thought his look strained. Gillane had stopped behind the police, and the sergeant advanced, pulling at his belt. "'I have a warrant, but my hands are frozen and I can't get inside my coat.' "'You can show us the warrant later,' said Jimmy. "'I'm James Leyland, the man you want.' "'We don't want you,' the sergeant replied. Jimmy's legs shook, and he sat down in the snow. After the long strain, his relief was poignant and reacted on his exhausted body. He gave the sergeant a dull, puzzled look. "'Then whom do you want?' "'Harvey Stannard,' said the other, and Stannard turned. His figure cut the misty background and he carried himself as if he were not disturbed. In fact, Jimmy imagined he had expected something like this. "'I am Stannard. Why do you want me?' "'When I can loose my belt, I'll read you the warrant. The charge is killing Game Warden Douglas.' "'Then Douglas is dead?' said Stannard in a quiet voice. "'He died four or five days since.' the sergeant replied. "'Ah,' said Stannard, and braced himself. "'Well, I have nothing to state. I reserve my defense. "'Stop him!' shouted the sergeant, and leaped across the snow. 
Stannard stepped back, stumbled on the steep bank, and vanished. For a moment, Jimmy, numbed by horror, wondered whether his imagination had cheated him. Then he saw Stannard was really gone, and he ran for the ledge. The others joined him, but Stannard was not on the ledge. Two or three hundred feet below, a dark object rolled down a long slab, and at the bottom plunged into a gulf where the gray mist tossed. "'He's gone,' Deering remarked to the sergeant. "'Perhaps you'll find him when the snow melts.' They went back to the spot where they had left their packs and ropes. For a time all were quiet, and then the sergeant said to Deering, "'He beat me, but I don't get it yet. I didn't reckon on his going over. He stated he reserved his defense.' "'Perhaps he was rash,' Deering remarked in a thoughtful voice. "'In the meantime, however, we must let it go and think about getting down to the bush. How did you find us?' "'We went for a neck behind Mr. Leyland's shack. When we saw no tracks, we pushed along the main range. We reckoned you'd gone by the long ridge, and we might cut your trail.' We were three nights in the rocks, and are all played out. Then you had better join us. We are going to try Stannard's line down the gully. I don't engage to make the woods, but I don't see another plan. The sergeant hesitated. Stannard hit the line? He declared the line would go, said Deering quietly. Perhaps you have not much grounds to trust him, but he was a great mountaineer. Jimmy turned and threw Deering the end of the rope. Don't talk, he said to the sergeant. If you mean to join us, tie on. We must start. A few minutes afterwards they crossed the shelf. Deering led, and Jimmy, going first on the second rope, rather doubted if they would reach the trees. In summer, the long straight crack was obviously the mountain's rubbish chute, and its sides were ground smoothly by rolling stones. Now it was packed by hard, firm snow. To slip would mean a savage glissade, and then perhaps a plunge. Much depended on the leader's nerve. Reaching down, held by the rope, he must chip out holes, and then, when the man behind him occupied the notches, move a foot or two and cut another. Sometimes Deering used his boots, and sometimes the ice pick. But for the most part, when his party had gone across, the holes were broken and Jimmy was forced to cut. The labor was exhausting, and by and by Deering owned he had had enough. The trouble was to help him back and put another in his place, but Gillane got into the loop and brought them down some distance. Then he stopped, and for a few minutes all lay in the snow. Mist hid the bottom of the gully, and none dared hope their labor would be lightened much when they got there. For all they knew, they were painfully crawling down to the top of a precipice, in fact, nobody was willing to brace up for the effort to change the leaders. After a time, Jimmy turned his head. The mist was lifting. It went up in torn shreds, and the bottom of the gully began to get distinct. Where the dark trough ran out from the rocks, a smooth snowfield went down. The vapor steadily rolled off the slope until Jimmy saw a vague, dark belt he thought was timber. His heart beat, and he got back his pluck. "'Stannard hit the proper line,' he said. "'We'll pitch camp in the woods.' Dillon took Gillane's post, the sergeant took Jimmy's, and they pushed on. By and by the mist rolled down and hid the pitches below, but now all knew where they went, the gloom vanished and slack muscles were braced. For all that, when they reached the snowfield, Deering looked to the west and frowned. "'The light's going, and the trees are a long way off,' he said. 
Mush along, boys. You have got to get there. In places the snow was loose, and to get forward was hard. Jimmy pushed Stevens for some distance, and they were forced to stop for a young police trooper. On some pitches the snow was hard and slippery, and rocks with icy tops broke the surface. Dark crept up from the valley, and the trees were behind the ground in front. Yet from the daunting gully they had looked down across the vast white slope, and the picture that melted like the mist led them on. Ahead were rest and food and warmth. At length, two or three hours after dark, Dillon stumbled and rolled in the snow. "'Watch out for the juniper I ran up against,' he shouted. "'Keep going. This trail's for the woods.' Half an hour afterwards, Jimmy threw off his pack and leaned against a spruce. The ground was steep and stony, but rows of small trunks cut the glimmering snow. All round was fuel, and one could build a shelter and eat hot food. He thrilled, and the blood came to his frozen skin. They had run daunting risks and borne all flesh and blood could bear, but the strain was done with. They had made it. End of chapter 31 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 32 of Northwest This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline Northwest by Harold Bindloss Chapter 32 by the campfire. In the timber the cold was not very keen and the tired men braced themselves for the effort to pitch camp. Peter and the sergeant took control and soon a big fire burned behind a wall of branches. Against the wall twigs and thin branches were packed for beds. Where the bushman can find fuel and material for building he does not bother about the frost and in winter the Royal Northwest patrols sleep by their campfires far out on the snowy wilds. A trooper fried pork and doughy bannocks, Deering brewed a kettle of strong tea, and when all had eaten like famished animals, the men, for the most part, went to sleep. For a time, however, Deering, the sergeant, and Jimmy sat by the fire and smoked. On the mountains they were absorbed by the stern physical effort and concentrated mechanically on getting down. Animal instinct urged them forward, but now the risk of freezing was gone they began to think like men. The sergeant and Jimmy were puzzled and imagined they might get some light from Deering. Jimmy's brows were knit, and when he looked about he frowned. Although he was warm and the hot tea had revived him, he felt his brain was dull. Sparks leaped up from the fire, smoke tossed about the camp. One heard the wind in the pine tops, and the trunks reflected gleams of flickering light. The mist had blown away, and Jimmy saw far off a dim white ridge cut the sky. Then he turned his head and shivered for he knew Stannard's broken body was somewhere in the rocks, and perhaps nobody would find the spot. Stannard was his friend, a cultivated gentleman and a famous mountaineer, but he had slipped and gone down the precipice like a raw tourist. Moreover, although it looked as if he had killed the game warden, he had said nothing. In fact, it looked as if he were willing for Jimmy to pay. Yet Jimmy was not persuaded, for Stannard to use treachery like that was unthinkable. "'You're satisfied I'm not accountable for the shooting accident?' he said to the sergeant. "'I guess my chiefs are satisfied. Our orders were to leave you alone.' For a few moments Jimmy was quiet. He had carried a heavy load, and now the load was gone. He could urge Margaret to marry him and get on with his ranching. 
perhaps if she agreed he might go back to lancashire but he must not yet dwell on this when did your officers find out i had nothing to do with it he resumed not long since the day before warden douglas died all the time he was at the hospital we waited for his statement but got nothing although i've seen men shot douglas puzzled me and i reckon he puzzled the doctors sometimes he was sensible but he didn't talk and when we asked him about the shooting he looked at us as if he'd plumb forgot then one day it all came back and he gave us his story the night was dark and douglas could not see much deering remarked i expect you had something to go on that helped you fill out his statement the sergeant smiled the trooper who measured up the distances and made a plan for the clearing was a surveyor's clerk then douglas was shot in the center of his chest but the mark at the back was to one side. Besides, we had got Mr. Leyland's hired man. Miss Jardine put us on his track. He sure doesn't like Mr. Leyland, but his tale was useful. In fact, if Mr. Leyland had not pulled out, you would not have bothered him? I expect that is so. When Stannard sent Mr. Leyland off, he reckoned to give us a useful clue. Our duty was to try the clue. Jimmy looked up sharply, but Deering said, Stannard's plan was good, but your officers are not fools. Then another thing is obvious. If you had tried very hard, you might have hit Mr. Leyland's trail before. It's possible, the sergeant agreed with a touch of dryness. Maybe the bosses were after Stannard but i don't get it all yet stannard was not a fool i guess he knew we couldn't put it on him that he meant to shoot douglas since he was using the pit light he'd have gone to the pen but i guess he could have stood for all he got yet when he saw he was corralled he stepped back off the rocks stannard was an english highbrow a year or two in a penitentiary would have knocked him out Perhaps this accounts for it. Oh, well, said the sergeant. I guess we'll let it go. For three nights I've shivered on the rocks, and I want to sleep. He lay down on the branches, and Jimmy waited. The smoke was gone, the fire was clear, and red reflections played about the quiet figures at the bottom of the rude wall. After a time, Jimmy thought all slept and he turned to Deering. "'I don't know if the sergeant was satisfied, but I am not. You imply that when Stannard stepped back he knew where he went?' Deering pondered. He saw Jimmy was disturbed and puzzled, but he doubted if there was much use in enlightening him. Stannard was gone. Jimmy had trusted the fellow and had already got a nasty knock. Yet, if he had begun to see a light, Deering had not meant to cheat him. He was not Stannard's champion. "'Well,' he said, "'it certainly looks like that.' "'But why? The sergeant thinks they would not have tried Stannard for shooting with intent to kill. He declares Stannard could have stood for all he got.' "'I expect that it's so. Sometimes, however, people are not logical. For example, when you thought you had shot Douglas, you pulled out. I ought to have stayed. Now I think about it, Stannard rather persuaded me to go, Jimmy agreed, and looked at Deering hard. When you recently found out Stannard had gone to my help, why did you go after him? For one thing, I knew he had not got a proper guide. I thought the job a man's job, and Stevens and Dillon are boys. Somehow, I fear that's not all, said Jimmy, and for a moment or two was very quiet. Then he resumed, When Stannard and I were on the ledge, you were at the corner, 
I was going to jump on the slab, but you shouted. Sometimes you're rash. When you jump on a rock, you want to know the rock is sound. The slab was not sound, said Jimmy in a hoarse voice. Still, I was on the rope, and Stannard knew if I went down, I might pull him off the ledge. He stopped, and Deering saw he did not want to solve the puzzle. It's done with, and you're a staunch friend, he resumed. Well, I'm very tired. Deering gave him a sympathetic nod, and pulling his blanket round him, got down on a pile of twigs. Jimmy sat with his back against a log and looked into the gloom behind the black pine tops. High up on the lonely rocks, a rotten slab dropped to the gully, and but for Deering's staunchness, he might have taken an awful plunge. In the meantime, the cold was keen, his body was exhausted, and his brain was dull. He did not know much and did not want to know all. The thing was done with, and he resolved to let it go. By and by he got down on the twigs by Deering, stretched his legs to the fire, and went to sleep. In the morning, after breakfast, the sergeant lighted his pipe and stopped the troopers, who had begun to roll up their packs. "'We won't break camp yet, boys,' he said, and turned to Deering. Mr. Stevens can't stand for a long hike, and my orders were to bring Stannard back. Sometimes the police orders do not go, said Deering dryly. Until the snow melts, nobody will bring Stannard back. He has cheated you. I've got to try and want your help. You can reckon on mine, said Dillon, and looked at Jimmy. Laura must be satisfied. That is so. I'm going to stay, said Jimmy. And when Deering agreed, the sergeant ordered a trooper and Gillane to start for the railroad. He stated he must send a report, and Jimmy and Dillon gave the packer some telegrams. The men set off, and soon afterwards the others, leaving Stevens to watch the fire, began to climb the long steep ridge behind the camp. The effort cost them much. All were slack and tired, and knew their labor would not be rewarded. Yet for some hours they struggled across the snowfields and searched the rocks with the glasses. In the afternoon they went back, and lying about the fire, talked and smoked. At daybreak they started again and reached higher ground. The day was bright and the rocks and gullies were distinct, but when the sun sank behind the range they had found nothing. All the same Jimmy saw that when Stannard resolved to try the gully his judgment was strangely good. There was not another line down the rocks and nowhere but at the bottom could the party have reached a slope leading to the trees. At length Deering gave the sergeant his glasses. "'Nothing's on the big gravel bank, and we can't get up the cliff,' he said. "'I have had enough, and I expect you are satisfied. Maybe you'll find Stannard after the thaw, but when he stepped off the rocks I think he went for good.' "'I've tried,' said the sergeant. "'Let's get down. At sunup we'll pull out for the railroad.' They went back, but after supper nobody talked much. Somehow the camp was gloomy, and Jimmy fought against a vague sense of horror. To know they would take the trail in the morning was some relief. At daybreak they broke camp and started downhill. All were glad to go, but when they reached the valley, Jimmy stopped and looked up at the distant white streak in the rocks. Now he was on level ground, to picture his crawling down the awful gully was hard, and at the top was the snowbank where Stannard vanished. Jimmy shivered, but after a few moments turned and ran to join the others. 
He was young, the sun was on the mountains, and the doubts and horror he had known melted like the dark. The thing was done with, the load he had carried was gone, and he was free. Perhaps it was strange, but he began to perceive that the freedom he thought he enjoyed with Stannard was an illusion. Stannard's light touch was very firm, and he had led Jimmy where he did not mean to go. Laura, not knowing all she did, had helped him to resist, and when he knew Margaret, Stannard's control was broken. It looked as if Stannard had not meant to let him go, but Jimmy refused to speculate about the other's plans. At length, so to speak, he was his own man. He had paid for his extravagance, and extravagance had lost its charm. Now he knew no obstacle to his marrying Margaret, and if she were willing, he resolved to resume his proper job at the cotton mill. When he thought about it, his heart beat, but Margaret was not yet persuaded, and unless she knew his relations approved, to persuade her might be hard. Well, Sir James was at Vancouver. In fact, he was perhaps at the hotel, and Jimmy was keen to meet him. Progress, however, was slow. Broken trees and rocks from the mountain blocked the way. Fresh snow had fallen, and Stevens was lame. He had slept with his wet boots on, and his foot was frostbitten. Then Dillon was slack and moody. His fatigue was not gone, and if Gillane had sent the telegrams, when the party reached the settlement, Laura would be waiting. Dillon shrank from enlightening her, and Jimmy sympathized. End of chapter 32 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 33 of Northwest. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Northwest by Harold Bindloss. Chapter 33. Sir James Approves. The sun was low, but the light was good, and Jimmy's party, crossing a hillside, saw a long plume of smoke. The smoke moved, and when it melted, the rumble of a distant freight train rolled up the valley. After a time, they saw telegraph posts, a break in the rocks, and two or three small houses. Then their fatigue vanished, and all went fast, but Jimmy was sorry for Dillon, whose mouth was tight. Jimmy thought Laura waited at the railroad, and Frank must tell her Stannard would not come back. Moreover, she must soon know Stannard had shot the game warden and was willing for Jimmy to pay. When they reached the bottom of the hill, he stopped Dillon. "'I expect Laura has got a cruel knock, but perhaps we can save her some extra pain. If you take the line you think will hurt her least, I'll play up, and you can trust Deering.' Dillon said nothing, but gave Jimmy a grateful look. Half an hour afterwards they pushed through a belt of trees and saw a party waiting by the railroad. It was obvious the telegrams had arrived. Although the people were some distance off, Jimmy picked out Margaret, who stood by a man he did not think was Jardine. The bush ranchers did not wear furs like his. By and by he distinguished Mrs. Dillon and Mrs. Jardine, graham the section hand and a police trooper but they were not important and he speculated about the stranger until when the track was not far off he saw a light margaret's companion was sir james leyland jimmy frowned his uncle's arrival was awkward for he had rather hoped to work on margaret's emotion and carry her away in fact, he had wondered whether to take her boldly in his arms might not be a useful plan. Now the plan would not work, although when he stopped in front of Margaret he saw she was moved. 
the blood came to her skin and her glance was very kind. She wore an old fur cap and a soft deerskin jacket. In fact, her clothes were a rancher's daughter's clothes, but somehow she was marked by a touch of dignity. She gave Jimmy her hand, and he turned to his uncle. "'You know Miss Jardine, sir?' "'It looks like that,' Sir James replied with a smile. "'Since you are my nephew, I felt I ought to know your friends. Then Miss Jardine was kind, and seeing my curiosity, helped to throw some light upon your romantic adventures.' Jimmy gave Margaret a grateful look and laughed. "'I expect you were puzzled, sir?' "'To some extent I was puzzled,' Sir James agreed. "'I'm a sober and perhaps old-fashioned business man. The golden days when I was young and rash are gone, but one recaptures a reflection of their vanished charm.' "'Ah,' said Jimmy, "'I knew you were human.' No days were golden for Uncle Dick. I expect you know we jarred? Dick indicated something like that, but he has a number of useful qualities. Perhaps they're inherited qualities, because I think one or two are yours. For example, I went to see your ranch. You have made good progress on sound business lines, although chopping trees is obviously a strenuous job. "'Do you know much about ranching?' Jimmy inquired. "'I do not. Miss Jardine thought I ought to see the ranch, and her father enlightened me.' Margaret blushed, and Sir James smiled. "'Friends are useful, Jimmy, so long as one's friends are good. But we mustn't philosophize. They are cooking some food for you at the post office, and the station agent has agreed to stop the Vancouver Express. He imagines the train will arrive before very long. They went to the post office, and soon afterwards the train rolled down the gorge. Jimmy helped Margaret up the steps, gave Peter his awkward thanks, and jumped on board. By and by the car sped past a small stone hut, and he wondered whether he was the man who had not long since stolen down at night to meet the section hand. When they reached the hotel, the guests Jimmy had known were gone, and a lonely stranger occupied a room. The clerk stated they would shut down for the winter as soon as the party went, but dinner would be served as usual in the big dining room. Jimmy, refreshed by a hot bath, dressed with luxurious satisfaction. To wear clean, dry clothes, and no others would cook his food, was something new. When he went downstairs, Sir James was in the rotunda. "'Now you are the fashionable young fellow I expected to meet,' he remarked with a twinkle. "'You see, Dick drew your portrait.' "'Oh, well,' said Jimmy. I expect I bothered Dick, and perhaps he was a better friend than I thought. All the same, I hope to persuade you the portrait was something of a caricature. Sir James gave him a thoughtful glance. It is possible. When you came down the hill at Green River, carrying your heavy pack, your mouth tight and your eyes fixed, I knew my nephew. Sometimes, when the cheap mill engine stopped and your father put down his pen and took off his coat, he looked like that. Well, it's long since I have got a title I did not particularly want. But after all, we are new arrivals, and the primitive vein is not yet run out. He stopped and resumed. Mrs. Dillon is in the drawing room, but we must wait for Miss Jardine. She and her father are my guests. You are kind, but I thought them my guests, sir. Sir James smiled. You are rather dull, Jimmy. After all, I am the head of your house. They went to the dining room, and at the door Jimmy stopped. Margaret and Jardine crossed the belt of polished wood between the pillars, but now Margaret was not dressed like a bush girl. 
the deerskin jacket was gone, her clothes were fashionable, and her skin shone against the fine, dark-colored material. Yet she was marked by the grace and balance one gets in the woods, and Jimmy thought her step like a mountain deer's. Then he saw his uncle studied him, and he crossed the floor. Mrs. Dillon, Frank, and Deering came in, but although Sir James was an urbane host, sometimes the talk got slack. Laura had not come down, and another occupied Stannard's chair. The stranger Jimmy had remarked dined alone, some distance off, but when Mrs. Dillon got up, he joined the group. "'You agreed to give me an interview,' he said to Sir James. "'That is so,' Sir James replied. "'You wanted to see my nephew, I think, and since we may talk about Stannard, I would like Mr. Deering to join us.' They went to the rotunda, and the stranger pulled out some documents. He was old and rather fat, but his clothes were fastidiously neat, and his glance was keen. "'You know I'm Mason, and my London address is on my card,' he said. "'The card does not state my occupation, but I lend money.' "'I imagined something like that,' said Sir James. "'Stannard was your partner?' "'He was my agent. Stannard belonged to exclusive sporting clubs I could not join. But perhaps this is not important.' I understand you are satisfied he is dead?" Deering nodded. "'Nothing made of flesh and blood could stand for his plunge down the rocks. Since he was a famous mountaineer, I expect you thought his carelessness strange.' "'I have some grounds to think you could account for it,' said Deering, dryly. "'We will talk about this again.' said Mason, and turned to Sir James. "'Mr. Leyland owes me a large sum. I have bought his notes.' Sir James studied the documents and gave them to Jimmy, who admitted the account was accurate. "'Very well,' said Sir James. "'My nephew meets his bills. The interest is high, but he must pay for his extravagance.' Before I write you a check, I want to see your agreement with Stannard, and would like some particulars. Mason gave him a document, and when Jimmy stated that he knew Stannard's hand, resumed, Stannard joined me some years since, at a time when he was awkwardly embarrassed. The combine had advantages. Stannard had qualities I had not. His friends were fashionable sporting people. For all that, he was bankrupt, and I supplied him with money. Exactly, said Sir James. Still, perhaps Stannard's agreeing to tout for you was strange. My nephew thought him a fastidious gentleman. There's another thing. Since he was willing to exploit his friends, did you not imagine he might cheat you? Mason smiled. Stannard dared not cheat me, and perhaps I can give Mr. Deering the light he wants. I knew something about Stannard that, had others known, would have broken him. When we made our agreement, he declared the person he had injured was recently dead, and the risk he ran was gone. Perhaps he was sincere, but sometimes I doubt. Not long since, when he began to keep back sums I ought to have got, I made inquiries and found out that another knew. In fact, it looked as if Stannard were buying the fellow's silence with my money. Had he been frank, I might have broken the extortioner, but he was not frank. I think he knew he had deceived me about the agreement and was afraid. Anyhow, he tried to meet the demands until— "'I think I see,' said Deering. "'You do not yet know all Stannard's plans, and now they're not important. I expect we can take it for granted that he imagined the demands could not long be met. Then he saw the police had found out his part in the shooting accident, and he went down the rocks.' "'It looks like that.' Mason agreed. 
Deering turned to Jimmy. Jimmy's look was stern, and his brows were knit. Deering thought he saw a light, but he said nothing, and Sir James got up. "'If you will go with me to the office, Mr. Mason, I will write you a check.' They went off, and soon afterwards Dillon joined Jimmy. "'Laura wants to see you,' he said in a disturbed voice. "'She knows Stannard shot Douglas, and it's now obvious he meant you to pay. But I rather think that's not all. She talks about her not being justified in marrying me. The thing's ridiculous. If Stannard was a crook, she's not accountable, but my arguments don't carry much weight. Perhaps you can help. You agreed to play up. I'll try, said Jimmy, and went to the drawing room. Nobody but Laura was about, and her forlorn look moved him. Her face was pinched, and all her color was gone, but she gave Jimmy a level glance. "'You know I'm sorry,' he said, and taking her cold hand, resumed with some embarrassment, "'Frank's my friend, and you were very kind. Not long since, I thought—' "'You thought you were my lover?' said Laura, in a quiet voice. "'You were lucky because you were not, but had you agreed to go back to the cotton mill, I might have married you. Now you know my shabbiness.' "'I know nothing like that,' Jimmy declared. "'I do, however, know I owe you much. You were the first to warn me where my extravagance led. Now I want to help.' "'Ah!' said Laura. You are generous. I was willing to cheat you, and it's plain my father was not your friend. Jimmy studied her and thought her afraid. In fact, he began to see why she had sent for him. Laura was keen. She knew something, but he imagined she did not know all. Anyhow, he was not going to enlighten her. "'You mustn't exaggerate the importance of the shooting accident,' he said. "'I and Mr. Stannard used our rifles. The night was dark, and I imagined I had hit the warden. I expect Mr. Stannard had no grounds to think the unlucky shot was his. Until recently the police believed the shot was mine.' Laura was quiet for a few moments, and then, with an effort, looked up. My father knew the rocks. He was a famous mountaineer. Yet when the police sergeant ordered him to stop, he went down the bank. After all, his carelessness was not very strange, Jimmy replied. Mr. Stannard was leader and had borne a heavy strain. In fact, we were all exhausted, and our nerve was gone. Then the police came out of the mist, the sergeant shouted, and Mr. Stannard knew they claimed he had shot the warden. He was startled and, so to speak, mechanically stepped back. He stopped, for although his object was good, he knew Laura's cleverness. He did not know if he had altogether banished her doubts, but she gave him a grateful look. "'Frank is your friend,' she said in a quiet voice. He wants me to marry him. Are you satisfied I ought not to refuse? Why, of course I'm satisfied, Jimmy declared. You had nothing to do with the shooting accident. You were my friend before Frank was. I hope we're friends for good. To refuse to marry Frank is ridiculous. Since I'm persuaded, you ought not to doubt. Laura gave him her hand. "'You are staunch, Jimmy, but I'm tired,' she said, and let him go. In the hall, Jimmy met Sir James, who said, "'I am going for a quiet smoke. Will you join me?' "'Not for a time, sir. Since I arrived, I've been strenuously occupied doing things I ought. Now I'm going to do something I want to do.' "'For example?' Sir James inquired. 
I'm going to talk to Margaret. I hope to persuade her to marry me. When I suggested our taking a smoke, my object was to inquire about your friendship for Miss Jardine. After all, I am your trustee. I hope you approve my plan, sir, Jimmy rejoined. You know where to stop, Sir James remarked with a twinkle. Perhaps my approval carries more weight than you think, because had I not approved, Miss Jardine would not have agreed. Then you have talked to her about it, said Jimmy with keen surprise. Not at all. Miss Jardine is not dull. I soon saw she understood my importance, but did not mean to use her charm. Her friendliness was marked by some reserve. In fact, it was plain she acknowledged my business was to judge if she were the girl for you, and she would not persuade me. Well, I liked her pride, and although we did not talk about it, I rather think she knew I did approve. Thank you, sir, said Jimmy with a grateful look. Sir James put his hand on Jimmy's arm. When I started from Bombay, I was bothered about you. Dick had found out something about Stannard, and he imagined that Miss Stannard was his accomplice. Miss Stannard didn't know Stannard's occupation. She is not accountable for her father. That is so, Sir James agreed. I think Miss Stannard a charming girl, but she was not the girl for you. Leylands are manufacturers, and your job is to control a big industry. Miss Stannard's is to cultivate her social talents and amuse herself. Margaret Jardine, however, is our sort. She's staunch and sincere. You know her pluck and all she risked for you. You want a wife like that, and I wish you luck. Jimmy found Margaret in the drawing-room. Mrs. Dillon had gone off with Laura, and Jimmy advanced resolutely. At Green Lake I asked you to marry me, and you refused. Yet you knew I loved you, and perhaps I had some grounds to think— The blood came to Margaret's skin. I did know, Jimmy, but to marry you because I stopped the trooper was another thing. Now you're ridiculous. All the same, in some respects, your refusal was justified. My drawbacks were plain. For all you knew, I was an extravagant wastrel, and the police were on my track. Since I mustn't urge you, I was forced to be resigned. Sometimes you are rather dull, Margaret remarked, and smiled. Well, I'm not forced to try for resignation now. I was something of an extravagant fool, but the police will leave me alone. The police were not the obstacle, said Margaret in a quiet voice. Jimmy laughed. It looks like that. The trooper who tried to catch us did not bother you long. If Sir James was the obstacle, he's, so to speak, removed. You have conquered him, and he declared a few minutes since that you were the girl for me. He's a kind old fellow. Don't you think you ought to indulge him? He reached down and took her hands. I want you, Margaret. My extravagance is done with. I'm going back to undertake my proper job, and I need your help. Then I must try to help said Margaret, and Jimmy took her in his arms. The End End of Chapter 33 Recording by Roger Moline End of Northwest by Harold Bindloss